the Virginia Horse Industry Board, Southwest Virginia Agricultural Association, and the Virginia Christmas Tree Growers Association are proud sponsors of Virginia Farming. This program is brought to you by the Virginia Farm Bureau. Large or small, Virginia farmers work year-round to help put food on your table. And Farm Bureau works year-round to help farmers and all Virginians. Farming, it's all good. To learn more, go to vafarmbureau.org. Brought to you by Farm Family. Life, auto, business, farm. Nancy Asher, stable owner, visionary, agent of change. Another personal story on farmfamilypeople.com. Farm Family, the people you know. Hi everybody, welcome to Virginia Farming. I'm Amy Rocher. This week we'll travel to the Meadow Event Park and talk with Leanne Layden, the executive director of the upcoming equine extravaganza. Then we'll learn about garden insects and how to control them when we join Mark Viette in the garden. And as always, we'll have the Ag Calendar and a Minute in the Field video. All this plus the Ag News of the Week on this edition of Virginia Farming. rely on market report information to make well-informed decisions. Although reports from USDA offices are unavailable due to the federal government shutdown, VDAX continues to publish Virginia livestock, grain, and vegetable market reports through its Virginia Market News Service. The reports include information on market conditions and prices and are available on the Market News website on your screen and the Market News hotline at 800-552-5521. As an additional service, Virginia Market News is providing links on its website to market reports from Kentucky, Missouri, North Carolina, South Carolina, Tennessee, and West Virginia. Well, honeybees play a vital role in food production, but the honeybee population is steadily declining due to the use of pesticides and a decrease in the number of flowering plants. But they are also threatened by a parasite called the varroa mite that could wipe them out. This tiny parasite attacks bee larvae and adult bees in the hives. So some beekeepers are now working with the University of Minnesota to improve their bees' genetics. They do this by selectively breeding hygienic bees that recognize sick bees and remove them from the hive. This prevents mites from reproducing and spreading throughout the hive. It's a slow, ongoing process because it takes at least four generations of bees to develop the desirable trait. In the meantime, beekeepers can rely on chemical treatments to keep the bees alive as they slowly work to improve the bees' genetics. Well, genetics also play a big role in the cattle industry, but how cattle are managed prior to heading to the feedlot can also have a big impact on how they perform later in life. In this segment, B.J. Scotts reports on stalker strategies that encourage marbling development. Stalker operators thrive on growing cattle on available feedstuffs. There's no one-size-fits-all plan. And even if you're aiming for a high-quality end target, Oklahoma State University research says that's okay. I think the good news is, especially if you have really high-quality genetics, there's a lot of different management approaches that you can use to achieve those high-quality grades. The kind of forage doesn't make as much difference as total gain during the growing program. A live body weight going into the feed yard is the greatest predictor of a positive marbling score or quality grade during closeout. And so bottom line is trying to, to get the maximum gain out of those cattle during the stalker phase appears to be important for the final outcome, maybe more so than again the type of forage that they graze uh, or whether or not we supplemented with starch or some other energy source during the stalker phase. That may be a switch in philosophy for some. What hasn't changed is the idea that gain in a backgrounding program should never go backward. So we need to make sure those calves have adequate energy so that they're, that they're growing at a rate that meets their genetic potential throughout their entire life cycle. And, and I believe in that scenario where producers are really going for high quality, maximizing that rate of gain, again, to achieve uh, the body weight going into the feed yard, the body weight uh, coming out of the feed yard is also going to result in 
achieving the genetic potential of that calf to marble. And so you're going to be able to capture the highest quality uh, by always having that calf in a positive plane of nutrition throughout the entire production cycle. I'm B.J. Scott. Thanks, B.J. A company in Burlington, Vermont, is now looking into turning dairy and brewery waste into algae-based biofuel on a commercial scale. Now, it's already known that nutrient-rich dairy and brewery waste can be used to grow algae, and the algae can produce fuel molecules that can create fuel that is fully interchangeable with home heating oil, diesel, and jet fuel. But the question is whether or not the fuel can be produced on a commercial scale on farms. And the Vermont Fuel Dealers Association has received a $51,000 grant from the USDA to research just that. The fuel could also potentially produce a byproduct of organic fertilizer that could replace imported synthetic phosphorus fertilizers. Well, small family farms make up a large portion of our farms here in Virginia. Many start out with a few backyard chickens, maybe a goat or two. But as Lonnie Furbank reports, adding even, even one cow changes the whole picture. Sweet Pea, Heidi, Big Ginger, Little Ginger, Swiss Miss, Gracie, and Charity are all treated like family at Misty Morning Farm. <laughs> Good girl. Yeah. But these girls aren't people. They're miniature and small standard registered Jersey cows. For years we were a hobby farm. We've raised our own milk and meat and eggs. But what happened was the neighbor gave us a heifer calf that whose mama had died. And he was like, you want to raise this calf? So we said, sure. So we raised our own formula. We didn't know any different. And then we sold her. And we, make, we made money on her. <laughs> Not a lot, but we made money on her. And we were like, oh, well, that was easy and it was fun, you know. Now, Faith and Adam Schlabach raise these jerseys to be once-a-day milk cows for local families. That one cow, the whole aspect of your um, homestead changes. Because with the cow, you now have fertilizer, 22,000 pounds a year from the average cow. You now have meat from the bull calves that come along. So now you have meat, you have milk, you have... Um, you have food for your chickens, you have food if you want to raise a pig. You can do so much with that cow. Having a cow can be a bit of a commitment. So they usually don't come and get a cow, and so they've done the gardening thing, they've planted a couple of fruits, they've got some chickens, and they're like, hey, I did all right with that, now let's get a cow. But it's well worth it in the long run. You think about it, she's kind of like a perennial. She keeps reproducing. I mean, potentially you never have to buy another cow. Misty Morning's cows are ideal for families because they only produce one to three gallons of milk daily, and they only need a few acres of pasture. But, and it's as local as you can get. Faith and Adam like to say that they are part of a movement they call the return of the family milk cow. I would say that 70% of the people buying cows off of us have never had a milk cow before. So they're big on educating their clients about cow care. And they'll even offer a milking school where they'll teach you how to milk the cow. So milking school starts in the morning about usually about 9 o'clock and it goes until 5 and we have several and sessions. Um, there's lecture and then there's hands-on and the hands-on would be the actual milking and care of the cow. And you just sit down here for the next 15, uh, 12, 15 minutes. We're going to just relax and get some milk. I'm closing okay. it off here then I squeeze with these fingers down here. Okay. Then, it's, and then it empties then I open it I open it up, I squeeze it off again. If you know you're milking fast enough, then you get a real nice foam head on top of the milk. And then during the lecture portion, we talk a lot about care and avoiding mastitis and ketosis and milk fever and, and what do you do if you do have those issues. Because I would say in a farm like ours, according to my vet, we would have 85% less of those things, but they still could occasionally pop up. Okay. And so you need to know how to deal with them. Okay. These cows are raised without hormones, and the calves drink real milk for four to six months in order to be fully developed for healthy grazing. But beyond that, Faith and Adam want to share this lifestyle with their clients and their family. Believe it or not, that's oftentimes what we do when we have the other cow. We both milk that we come in at the same time, and that's our Friday evening date. <laughs> <laughs> and we're always trying to teach our kids responsibility with the animals anyway. And of course... Sweet Pea or Little Ginger will always be a lifelong family friend. <laughs> oh. So he'll be my relief milker when he grows up. <laughs> For Virginia Farming, I'm Lonnie Furbank. Thanks, Lonnie.
One of the largest equine events in our region is coming up in November. We'll visit the Meadow Event Park and talk with Executive Director of the Equine Extravaganza. That's straight ahead on Ag Insights. Today we're at the Meadow Event Park, the birthplace of one of the most famous horses in history, Virginia's own Secretariat. So I guess it's kind of befitting that one of the largest equine events on the East Coast is held here. It's November 1st through 3rd. Let's head on over to the Equine Center and talk to Leanne Layden about the equine extravaganza. So here we are at the Equine Center and I'm joined by Leanne Layden and she is the Executive Director of the Equine Extravaganza that's happening in November. Leanne, thanks for having us here today. Oh, thanks for coming to the Meadow. The equine industry is huge in Virginia. Share some of those numbers with us. It has an enormous economic impact, uh, at least $1.2 billion, according to a study that was commissioned by the Virginia Horse Industry Board, who is at, also a sponsor of Equine Extravaganza, we're happy to say. And so uh, Virginia, of course, our horse history goes back to colonial times, and um, this has been something important to the state for centuries. So Leanne, give me some history, some background about the Equine Extravaganza. The equine extravaganza, uh, if ever you could say Virginia's for horse lovers, this event is for horse lovers. Um, it's been in existence for about 10 years. Um, it is, was held here in 2010 and 2011 at Meadow Event Park. Um, last year it went to a different location and then early this year the Virginia Farm Bureau, which owns Meadow Event Park in State Fair, Virginia, purchased equine extravaganza. So now Meadow Event, Event Park, the birthplace of Secretariat, is the permanent home of equine extravaganza. So when people come out to this extravaganza, what are they gonna be able to see? Everything equine. We have got about 100 different uh, clinics, demonstrations, seminars with some of the top horse trainers in the country doing everything from barrel racing, dressage, um, uh, cowboy managed shooting, um, jumping, trail riding, all those types of things. So what if you are a rider, it'll be something for you. If you're not a rider, there are going to be so many different horses that you can see. We have a breed and stallion pavilion, and we have got different breeds lined up from the big, beautiful Frisians to mini horses um, to Pasifinos, um, Appaloosas, all different kinds of horses. So you'll certainly see all different kinds of horses, all different kinds of riding. And then we've got a lot of really wonderful special events that involve horses. The Meadow Event Park is rich in history because of Secretariat. What else makes it so special and makes it different from other equine events that are held in other places? A lot of people absolutely consider this um, hallowed ground. And as I tell people, I give tours here that you're walking in the hoof prints of history. He was born here March 30, 1970. He was first, he was raised here. He was first trained here. We have the training center where he stayed. Um, we have the foaling shed where he was born. We have the yearling barns where he was a yearling. Um, he first had a saddle and bridle on him right here. So really the foundation was laid for a legend right here. And um, it's very meaningful for us to be stewards of that legacy here in Virginia. So the Meadow Event Park is over 300 acres. It's a large place. How are you planning on getting people from one end to the other during this event? We're going to have trams that will shuttle you back and forth from over here at the Equine Center to across the road where the big exhibit hall will be with lots of wonderful horsey vendors and a lot of our clinicians doing their um, demonstrations and everything. And then we'll have a separate tram, which is the narrated tour tram. And we will have narrators on the tram that will take you around to the points of interest of the historic barns where Secretariat was raised and tell you some of the stories about that. So actually two different types of trams and one will be um, a hoof prints of history tram. So we talked about the history of this place and its importance with being the birthplace of Secretariat. And I understand one of the events that's coming up for, from this extravaganza is a screening of a new movie. Tell me about that. Yes, we are so honored that uh, Equine Extravaganza is going to be the exclusive Virginia premiere for the new documentary called Penny and Red, The Life of Secretary's Owner. And it's an hour-long documentary um, uh, featuring Penny Chenry, Secretary's Owner, who of course used to own the meadow, and she wanted to tell her story in her own way. 
And if you've seen the Disney movie, um, you may be familiar with the story. Penny wanted to tell her own story. So it's in her own words, her own memories, um, some wonderful footage of Secretariat. And uh, it just uh, premiered in um, Kentucky at the Secretariat Festival. So we're only the second site to have it. And they wanted to do the second premiere at his birthplace here in Virginia. So that will be on Saturday, November 2nd, Penny and Red. One of the events I saw listed is the Maceo event. Explain that to me. Tell me what it is. Okay. Maceo Gypsy Festival Equestrian Show. And this is a marvelous show. It's like Cirque du Soleil on horseback. It'll be under a big top tent um, out in the front of uh, the Farm Bureau Center. And the, these are seventh generation Italian equestrian acrobats. They bring in 10 different breeds. They do all kinds of wonderful tricks and stunts and aerial feats of daring, all set to a, acoustic uh, gypsy music. So it's gonna be very entertaining. We have two performances a day, Friday and Saturday, one performance on Sunday, and uh, you can get your tickets ahead of time or on the grounds. And they'll be doing warm-ups prior to each show. So you get to have a taste of each performance uh, before a show and also uh, doing some trick training uh, during the extravaganza. So we are thrilled to have them here. So this is a large event, it's three days long. Tell me some more about some of the special events that are going on here. Oh goodness, there's so many. I'm not sure where to start, but um, we're having, we're real excited. We're having the Richmond Mounted Squad is going to do a mounted police horse urban obstacle course. So if you want to see if your horse can do what a police horse does, they're going to have a course set up and you can um, enroll in this and uh, register in this and see, try this urban challenge with different obstacles. There'll also be another trail challenge that two of our top clinicians, Brock and Leisha Griffith, are going to do. So that will be another uh, exciting feature. We will have um, Virginia's finest uh, food and wine products. We're excited about that. Another kind of a, a celebrity horse, if you will, um, uh, there was a recent um, publicity about Sergeant Reckless, who was a brave little mare in the Korean War. She just had a statue dedicated to her uh, at the U.S. Marine Corps Museum in Quantico. Um, she saved lots of soldiers' lives in the Korean War. She carried 9,000 pounds of ammunition one day under enemy fire up and down the mountains. And just this brave little mare, she was actually a Marine. And so she had the statue dedicated to her. And the people who spearheaded that effort and who are with the U.S. Marine Corps Museum are coming to tell the story of Sergeant Reckless. And um, since this is before Veterans Day, we're going to offer uh, uh, military veterans uh, a discount uh, with, an, active, uh, with uh, an ID card. So Sergeant Reckless is going to be another highlight of Equine Extravaganza. Was well, there anything that we left out that you would like our viewers to know about the Equine Extravaganza? Ah, uh, it's come to the meadow and have a Virginia Horse Lovers Weekend at Equine Extravaganza. Well, it sounds like it's going to be a great event. Thank you so much for having us out here today. Oh, thanks for coming, and we invite everybody to come experience the unbridled excitement of Equine Extravaganza at Meadow Event Park. We'll be right back. Winter weather can determine how many and what types of insects to expect in the following year's garden. Knowing what kind of insects you're dealing with is half the battle. With tips, here's Mark Viette. When we experience either very severe or very mild winters, it can allow insect populations or disease problems to really become much more prevalent in the garden. And after a mild winter, we find that insects can really be everywhere in a garden and many times the insects that we normally would see. And one of the insects that we will find in a garden is called a plant bug. This could be a box elder bug, milkweed bug. And let me just show you what they look like here in the garden. Right here at the base of this plant, or it used to be a plant rather, it is filled with plant bugs. And there are literally hundreds of these plant bugs 
on this plant. Now, a lot of us are familiar with, we have box elders. Uh, we will have thousands of these red bugs, red and black bugs coming inside during the fall, even during some of the late summer months. They'll come in uh, uh, through cracks and anywhere around the home. But you can find a lot of these if you just pay attention in the garden. And right here, and we'll look at a close-up shot, you can see all of these plant bugs right here. If you look at this plant right here, you can see some of the damage to the leaves done by the plant bug. And if you really want to see the plant bugs, you can just go and look. And they're adults and young, and there's just, you know, tons of them in here and they suck the juices out of plants. Now you can vacuum them and get rid of them that way, or you can go ahead and use a recommended pesticide according to the label to control, and there's a, a small one. So they're all over in these plants here, by the hundreds at the base of the plants. Mild winters also allow for a lot more disease problems than a garden. And looking at this, you know, leaf right here on this hosta, we might say, huh, something chewed the foliage. It looks like slugs. But we turn the leaf over, we don't see any signs of trails for slugs. And as we look at some of the other leaves, we notice a little more browning of some of the spots. Then the brown part dies and falls out, and it looks like an insect or something ate the leaves. Really, it was a disease. And one of the best ways to remember this in a garden is to keep a garden calendar. Maybe even take pictures with your digital camera and file them somewhere. And so they notify you next spring on the computer, five weeks earlier than when you normally see this in a garden, to treat for this. The other thing you can do is pull up all the old leaves, rake up all the old leaves, and get rid of that debris, which reinfects your plants year after year after year. Just be observant. That's a real easy way to notice things in the garden. And one of the problems that we experience in dailies is thrip. And this is a very small, tiny insect that as soon as the temperature warms up, it becomes much more evident. And this tiny insect sucks the juices out of daylily flowers and buds, but also affects other plants like hostas, and it's even in your lawn. So if you're treating your dailies, you sometimes need to treat your lawns. It is very hard to see, and you need to really look closely at the flower and pull the petals apart to find a thrip. But the damage that occurs is gonna be flowers which don't open correctly, buds that become twisted and contorted, and that is a sign that you might have thrip. It's very evident on pinks and red and purple dailies. You can really see that damage easily. And when you look at the flowers, you just got to get really close up to the flowers and pull them apart just like this. Two buds that are diseased and malformed right here. Now if you look very closely, you almost need a magnifying glass and you can see these little moving about the size of a pin tip. And your daily flowers can be filled with 10 or 20 in each flower alone. They suck the juices out of the leaves and out of the petals. And they also spread diseases. Just like mosquitoes spreading malaria and things of that nature. And I like to get a magnifying glass so you can get a magnifying glass and go out in the garden and really see this close up. Really, pre treatment is a great way to control this. You know, make sure you mark on your calendar that uh, May 1st to start treating for this problem. These are some plants we have not treated and always follow the label directions. And again, always pick up that old debris, get all the old foliage every winter or every spring to help control this problem. Once you have that gardening calendar, it'll tell you what to do at the right time of the year. I'm Mark Viette. Join me next time in the garden. 
Taking a look at the ag calendar, on November 12th through the 14th, the Small Farm Family Conference will take place in Lynchburg. Topics include farm business planning and production and marketing of high value crops and livestock. Strategies for saving on production cost and post harvest handling will be emphasized. And USDA agencies will be represented at the conference to discuss financial and other opportunities for small farmers. The deadline for registration is October 31st. Well, that does it for our show. Thanks for watching and have a great week. I'm Amy Rocher for Virginia Farming. This program is brought to you by the Virginia Farm Bureau. From apples to zucchini, Virginia farmers work hard to put food on your table. And Farm Bureau works year-round to help farmers and all Virginians. Farming, it's all good. To learn more, go to vafarmbureau.org. Brought to you by Farm Family. Life, auto, business, farm. Steve Morse, fruit grower, distiller, entrepreneur. Another personal story on farmfamilypeople.com. Farm Family, the people you know.